all else to me save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Word of Grace Church. I'm Fred. I'll be speaking uh, for the little intro this morning. And it's just a pleasure to be here. And so we welcome everybody. And if you're tuning in online, it's great to have you listening. And uh, you know what? It is such a thrill to be up here. I just, I've missed you guys so much. I know the last couple times I was supposed to do intros, I think in like January, we had the ice storm, so church was canceled. And then in February, I had to quarantine because I got the, I tested positive and I had to sit in my room by myself for a week. But you know what? We're here and I'm excited. So let's, uh, let's just dive into some of the uh, announcements and then we'll get right into the word of God. Amen. All right. So for, you know, just the, the typical announcements, you know, look to your bulletins. We continue to go on the Tuesday nights with the prayer. Uh, Wednesday nights is the, the men's big talk uh, studies. Uh, you know, check with Jerry. We, we typically got the, the women's study on Saturday. So look at your bulletins for all the dates and times for that. But we want to go before you guys with a special prayer request. Uh, this was given to me. Uh, we just want to just lift up a, a few people. So we want to lift up uh, Rita Bovin. Uh, she's going to be having surgery tomorrow at 1130. So we really want to just lift her up in prayer. Just ask that the, the, the Holy Spirit would just give divine guidance to the doctors and, and just watch over and protect her and just, you know, make sure all the details of that surgery is right where God wants them. Okay. And then a uh, second prayer request is for Ellie's son. Um, Chris Bascom, you know, and uh, Jerry wanted me to specifically ask you guys if you could pray for Jerry and Ellie because they are going to meet with him and the whole purpose of it because he's he's an atheist and doesn't believe and their whole intent is to meet with him and specifically witness to him with the hopes and belief that he'll get saved. Okay, so we really want to just lift that up and bathe that situation in prayer because you know what? 
It's God that does the saving, and it's the Holy Spirit that pricks people's hearts. You know, so we just really ask that God would go before that whole situation and just cover it for his will, and that Chris would get saved. Amen? Okay. So let's, uh, let's just, uh, I typically don't ever like to start without praying, so if we could just go before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you so much that right now we get to gather before you in peace, Lord. Lord, we just know all around the world, especially right now in Ukraine with the war going on, there is so much war and devastation because of the sin in this world. So we ask that you would please protect them, watch over them, not just the Ukrainians, but the, the Russians too that are forced into this war and they're just, they're doing what they're told. But a lot of them are, are regretting it. So we just pray that you would cover that situation. But we, we thank you so much that right here in our country, we're allowed to come and we can worship you in freedom with no fear of persecution. We thank you for this opportunity. But let it not go for nothing. Let us come, be excited, rub up against each other and fellowship. Iron sharpens iron with our brothers and sisters. And let it not be to fall on dead ears or, or just to become dull in our soul. But let us be energized through your spirit, through your presence, through your love, your compassion. And let us be that light on a hill for a lost and dying world out there. Let it not just end today in church, but let us grow from immaturity and graduate into the righteous zeal for good works for the lost. Energize our souls with your love through the spirit for the lost. We thank you so much for what you've allowed your son, Jesus Christ, to do on the cross to redeem our souls. Let it not be in vain. Let it not fall on dull ears and dull hearts this morning, but energize us through your spirit. Let us live in your presence. Acknowledge your presence this morning. We love you. We thank you. And we know that you're hearing us right now. And we lift up these prayers for your glory. Not just for us to say, oh yeah, I'm in the presence of God, it's my own benefit. But for your glory, that you would see that we love to sing to you. And we love to lift you up on high. You are worthy this morning. That's the whole intent this morning, is to come worship you. And that we may hear you talk back. We love you. We thank you. And Lord, I just pray that through your spirit, you would just loose my tongue to just speak exactly what you would have me to speak and what Pastor Chet would have us to speak. We thank you for this opportunity. Amen. Amen. Well, that was free of charge. That was a little energized. Jeez. <laughs> hey, I haven't spoken in a while, so I'm excited. No, but, um, you know, I really wanted to speak this and, you know, it might be a little late in the game because I know Pastor Chet's been speaking on first Peter and, you know, he's already up in the later chapters, but I thought I was going to be speaking this back in like, you know, January. So it's on first Peter and, uh, we're going to focus on first Peter chapter one, 18 and 19. And I just want to just explain why, like what goes before this, you know, when I, this was like one of the greatest blessings and, you know, as I'm standing up here, I do not want to be insensitive to anybody or just, you know, just throw this out and just hurt people's feelings or anything like that. But as you guys know, I did test positive for COVID and I had to quarantine, you know, and just God blessed me where when I ended up getting it, it was very, very mild. I basically had a sore throat. And, but with that said, I had to quarantine. I had to stay out of work. I had to be by myself. Uh, not only did I have to stay away from everybody in the public and stuff, but in my house, I was like quarantined to my bedroom and just <laughs> sitting in my bedroom for a week straight. You know what I mean? And so for me, I was only sick for like a day with a sore throat. So to me, it was like a vacation. Come on. 
I, God took this nasty, nasty curse and turned it into a blessing. I always pray to God, God, give me the time. Help me not to waste my time with, you know, Facebook, this, that, and the other thing and details of life. Help me, give me time, wisdom to like come before you and make time. And you know what? I think God answered my prayer and said, if you're not going to make time, I'm going to force you to make time. And I had a whole week to just sit there and bask in his presence and I was able to read. I read uh, my new study Bible that my mom gave me for my birthday. And I read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. I read all those. I read Mark because I wanted to get in the New Testament. And then not only in the, in the study Bible, but then I went back to my real Bible. And I read all the five books of the beginning of creation. Then I went back to Mark and I read Mark the Gospel. And I was so energized in my soul and I was praising God, just, just acknowledging his presence and practicing his presence. And then I was like, my gosh, I'm only halfway through the week. I still got another few days to go, you know? And so then I, I, I grabbed, uh, pastor Tom, uh, pastor Tom is, is, is passed away. It's, it's Leah's uncle, but Aunt Debbie gave me all his study books and, and I, so I ran upstairs and I grabbed his books and I was rifling through them. And I saw the book of the life of William Carey. And, and if you don't know him, he was one of, one of, not the first, but one of the first to go to India and to, and to witness. And he served for over 41 years over there. He was the first person to translate the Bible into Bengali, into their language. He didn't have one convert for over six years. And then finally someone got saved. But what was amazing was he was over there and I was there. I've been to India. I literally stood before his church. And as you walk through the door, he's got this sign. And this is where you guys might know this saying or this phrase. Attempt great things for God. Expect great things for God. You know, and so I was there and I got to see that. And then late, so I read his book and I was amazed. I was like, oh, this is great. Then I started watching documentaries. I watched one on Amy Carmichael. Again, she went to India, started an orphanage for the kids, you know, that were trafficked or that were hurt or just abandoned. And then I was like, I can't even take it. I can't take it. And so I watched another documentary. This one was on uh, Jim and Elizabeth Elliot and Isaac. What's his name? Is it Nate? Nate Saint. Nate Saint. He helped me remember because it rhymes. Nate Saint. He was the air airplane pilot. And they were missionaries down to Ecuador. And they, they witnessed to the native Indians there. And, and you think this has a great ending? No. They all got killed. The five of them right? Jim, Nate, and his other three partners, they went down and they were witnessing to the Indians and they finally made contact to this one tribe that has never been witnessed to. They all died trying to get the gospel to them. But that's not where it ends. Elizabeth, his wife, and all the other wives stayed and continued to witness to them. And the tribe got saved. Praise God for the courage, the passion, the righteous zeal for the, to save the lost. And so I was so blown away. And when I go back to William Carey, it wasn't just missionary work like, hey, here's some gospel, take it, leave it. No, God's work goes way past that. Way past it. Not only just to tell about that, but to save people. William Carey got the law of sacrificing babies in the Ganges River outlawed. So not only was he there to translate the Bible, teach about the gospel, teach people about Jesus, but he literally impacted the culture to change and, and get laws forbidden. I was on that river. I literally was on a boat in that river in Calcutta, India, during the week of Kali Puja, where they were 
making all kinds of idols of Cali and marching them down the street and tossing them into the Holy River. That's what they say the Ganges River is, the Holy River. And they were chopping goats' heads off and throwing them in the river. And we seen this all floating around. 200 years ago, you would have seen babies in that river. But through his love for Jesus Christ and his compassion for the lost, he got that law, that ritual outlawed. And then not only that, but he got the practice of widow burning outlawed. Where when the husband would die, they would take the wife, the widow, and strap her down and literally burn her alive as a sacrifice to the God. And this is all out of fear. But we don't have a God of fear. We have a God of love that wants to draw near to us and wants us to draw near to him. Now I say to you, and I got to wrap this up because we got communion today, so I got to cut it short. I got like 10,000 pages and two months worth of stuff I want to tell you. I'll do it next, next month. What is the one thing that drives these missionaries and regular people to witness to their community, to witness to their coworkers, to be missionaries, to go across the world and die for your savior. What is that one thing? Yes. In short, we know it's the, it's the will of God for your life. Okay. In short, we know that pastor Chad will tell you that, but how do you know this will? How do you get that driving passion and desire that zeal for good works? And this is where I want to go to 1 Peter 1.18. In the scripture, verse 18, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the, your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers. See, getting saved is no works program. We know that from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We're saved not by works, good works, but it's a gift, a free gift. By grace, through faith, that we're saved. Let's keep going into 19. So it's knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Ready, 19? This is it. Highlight it. Underline it. Do something in your Bible. But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That word precious is time in the Greek, which means honor. That which God honored the most out of everything in this universe, that which God honored the most, he was willing to spend it to purchase you back for all eternity. His blood, Jesus Christ's blood, beaten, tortured, mutilated, hung on a cross, get the picture. If you can't get the picture, I beg you, go watch the movie, The Passion of Christ, which is translated, The Sufferings of Christ. Get a picture of what our Savior did for us. And this is what the missionaries did. And because everybody thinks like, oh, wow, those missionaries, you know, God must have really had a call in their life, zapped them with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, next thing you know, they're off doing these amazing things. How come I can't do that? Listen, when I was reading the first five books, you got, you got Abraham, Moses, Isaac, Jacob, Caleb, Joseph, Joshua, all these people, what drove them? What drove William Carey, Amy Carmichael, all these missionaries to go out and do this? They all had one thing in common. They loved talking with God, communing with him, being in his presence, hearing from him, learning how much he loved them. And then it transformed them. 
In my study Bible, I just want to read one thing to you guys when I was going through Mark, and then I'm going to close because I'm running out of time. So this says, we find the account of choosing the 12 apostles in Mark chapter 3, 13 through 21. And then it says, notice the 14th verse. It tells why Jesus chose these men, comma, parentheses, that are quotations, that they might be with him, end quotations. And then it says, mark it in your Bible. This is what Jesus wants of his disciples today. And this I underlined and highlighted and everything that they will take the time to be in his presence and commune with him. And you can find that in John 15, 15 also, where he says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. I call you friends. In every missionary, every great man and woman of the Bible, it all started the same way. They didn't just all of a sudden become amazing. It all started the same way. They fell in love with God by being in his presence, practicing and acknowledging the presence of God and communing with him. And because they were either talking directly with God in the Old Testament through the prophets and through the leaders, or, or we get to read it in the New Testament, we learn about God. And we learn about Jesus Christ and what he did for us and what it costs to purchase our lives. Can we not give him what he purchased? Listen, don't be a bag of chips or a box of cereal to God this morning. And you might be thinking, what the heck are you talking about? How many times do we go to the grocery store and we want a bag of chips or we want a box of cereal and we make that purchase? And we expect to get what we purchased. But then we get home and we open it up and what do we find? Half a bag of air. Right? God not only died, Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive us of our sins, but he died for more than that too. He died for our communion our obedience, our longing for good works. Okay, we read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Well, everyone forgets about 10. We were created unto God, good works for God. Let's give him this morning what he purchased. Let's not half cut God. Give him what he's due this morning, seeing as he hung on a cross. I'm, God is slowly changing my heart to stop living in an avoidance Christianity where I wake up in the morning and I think it's enough to just get through the day without my petty little sins. If I can go to work and not get mad, if I can go to work and not swear, if I can go to work and not steal something, then I get home and I try not to get mad at Leah or the kids. And then I, you know, I'm, I already made it three quarters of the way through the day. So I'm just going to throw a TV show on real quick before I sin on accident and then just go to bed and hurry up and try not to sin. No, that's just called avoidance Christianity. Let's fall in love with Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and graduate from immaturity into maturity and have a righteous zeal to give God back what he purchased and what he is owed. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much and we thank you. We don't ever want to just cease from thanking you or take lightly what you paid to get us back. You paid the precious blood of Jesus Christ on the cross as a ransom, as a sacrifice to redeem us back to you so we could have fellowship with you throughout all eternity. We do not take that lightly. And we pray just like that first song we sang. Help us to live in your presence, which causes us to be overwhelmed and captivated 
by you. So that we don't just live in, a, in an avoidance Christianity, but we live a mature Christianity that longs to be holy and live in a righteous zeal for good works for you, that someone else might know you and to be able to experience your love. We thank you. Now I just ask that you please guide Pastor Chet's tongue and just give him words of fire that would edify, build up, convict whatever it needs to do to us today to draw us closer to you. We love you and thank you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we love you so much and we thank you for today. Amen. You sound a little bit like Greg getting up there when you got up there. A little bit like you guys are hanging around too much together. Too much. Jeez, excited. How can I follow excitement like that? Let's turn to First uh, Peter. Uh, and we will finish this last phase of courage. Motivation to move. Constrained by love, which is the source of all courage because it casts out all fear. Uh, a couple announcements Fred didn't have. Uh, we are going to take a door offering today, next week. I'm hoping to have a uh, friend, a, a guy who used to be in this church, um, Oleg uh, Usage, uh, come and speak a little bit on Ukraine, uh, do an intro on it, and uh, we'll take a door offering. We're going to add to it as a church. And uh, I still know people in Ukraine, by the way. I know missionaries in Ukraine. So how many, has anybody here been to Ukraine? Yeah. Vinny, you went on that trip, right? We've had people go on mission trips to Ukraine. Kiev, is that where you went? Yeah. We still know people there. So we're going to raise some money, and uh, they are going to go on the 19th. They're going to Ukraine. Uh, Jack Byers, I don't know if any of you remember Jack Byers. He was in this church years ago. Um, and uh, a friend of mine, Joe Holhouse, is going to go. They're going to go to Ukraine. So... Whatever we raise, they're going to take as a love gift to those that have needs so we don't have to go to a couple different parties. It's going to go direct to the churches that are in Ukraine that we uh, have been part of as a love gift to them to help them through it. So so be thinking about giving. Uh, I'm not sure we'll take an offering today because of communion and time is short. But uh, think about maybe if you feel led to give. Uh, next week, uh, we will raise some money and we will send that money because there is definitely a need. We are in First Peter. Uh, we're finishing. This is the idea of the fruit of courage, abundant fruit that God wants to give. Uh, we need to really go through this quick. I'm going to stay with the text. I really need you to be quickened. In the Old Testament, it wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. It was quicken me according to thy word. Quick, make me alive is the word quicken in the Old English. I need to be made alive by the word of God. It is sent to do, in Isaiah 55, what it's supposed to do. It will not come back void if you want to hear it. If you ask the Holy Spirit who wrote it, the main author of the 40 authors... He was with every author to inspire them. If you ask God to really make it do what he sends it to do, then it will do it. Now, Fred's nice, you know, and he doesn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. You ever notice God doesn't care about your feelings? If you read the scriptures a little bit, they're brutal, right? On your feelings. It's because God wants you to have the right mind. The right mind. He wants you to have, in 1 Corinthians 2.16, the mind of Christ. I'd have his mind. Let this mind be in you. 
in Philippians 2.5, right? That was also in Christ Jesus, right? He humbled himself unto death, not just death, but death that's shame. And, you know, we're, we're talking here about a church that's going through suffering. We live in an America, which is kind of a fairy tale land. It's kind of like as close to heaven as you can get. I mean that not in the sense of relationships, because relationships are all messed up. But I mean of amenities. Amenities. I can drive to church. You know, if it's cold, I can turn my heated seats on in a nice bar. But you got them? Yeah, they're really good. Some people have heated seats. I got heated seats in my car. And then, you know what? If it's hot outside, you can turn your AC on and feel cool, right? Whoever lived like that? We live like that. I mean, there's a reason a lot of people don't want to leave this life because this life for amenities is like huge, isn't it? We'll be going back to India. You know, I've talked to all the missionaries. The doors are opening again to return back. Uh, Israel is wide open for the gospel. I've got dates on my desk that the uh, Bimini, the Cohens, want us to visit. And uh, Oded. So I'll be going back to Israel to see the field. And uh, we have the same one. Hopefully in November we'll re to return to India. Maybe this year you... If you go this time, we'll take you to William Carey's Bible College. You didn't see that. Last time we went, we had a seminar in India at William uh, Carey's Bible College. I encourage you, like Fred said, read mission books. They'll give you some courage. Get things people went through for Christ. They're called, by the way, saints. I like saints. I like Catholic saints. Selena, I like Catholic saints. I like a CC and these guys, right? I like any kind of saint that separates themselves to God. I like missionary saints that went into all the world. Uh, William Carey, Adonai Judson, who was affected by Carey, hugely right in that chapel. He went to Burma, lost multi-wives, kids, tortured, translated the Burmese Bible, which is still used today in Burma. Translated it. Crazy faith. You need crazy faith. You need fervent love. Uh, I would say you want a book of the month, C.T. Studd. I'm reading that right now. The Cricketeer by Norman Grubb. What a great book. It was my favorite missionary book. I haven't read it in 30 years, rereading it right now, of how they lived and how they act and how the gospel was so real to them and how they gave up everything. Very wealthy man gave it all up gave it all away, and went to the mission field. Not just one mission field, multi-mission fields. Even in his old age, when he was sick and dying, you know, he was coughing on the road, went by and saw a track, and it said, cannibals need missionaries. And he looked at that and he laughed. He goes, cannibals, what a thing. And then God says, he looked at it, he goes, God says, why don't you go? And then he spent his last years and died in Africa with a note on the table, I don't think they ever found his body. One more tribe to win. Whew. I want to get courageous, read that stuff, right? We're talking about the most courageous men of the time of Christ, Christ being the leader of all courage, by the way, because real courage comes out of great love. Great love gives people real courage. If you don't have courage, if you're afraid, it's because... You don't have enough love. Does that hurt your feelings? No, I want you to have more love. Perfect love casts out what? Fear. And fear is what? Torment. Are you afraid to go to India? Why? If you could go, it's the, if it was the will of God for you to go or do something, why would you be afraid? The safest place to be is in the will of God. True. True. The most precarious place to be is outside the will of God. Shame comes either way. Greatest verse in the greatest theological book. Beware of theology. Love theology. Beware of it, too. It has a snare to it. A huge one. Makes people proud. I'm not saying you don't want to know the scriptures. I love theology. But I bow my knee before the Lord Jesus Christ, who is what theology is all about, by the way, right? 
I have to submit myself. I say that because I had a debate. I talked to somebody about theology. They want more theology. And I'm like, as long as you're willing to bow before the God of theology, and as long as you're willing to what? To oh, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. I've watched pastors fall, theologians fall. They weren't a doer of the word. They were a knower, maybe, in less knowledge, but they weren't a doer of the word. They weren't servants of all, were they? They like to serve themselves, like our politicians, to people. We need to be doers of the word and serve people as we serve God. God needs nothing, but he needs us to serve. Does he not? You are his hands, you are his feet. We'll talk about that in communion. But you are his body. You're his body now. He has two bodies. He has a body he is spiritually in heaven with now. But he has a body here on earth. You are his hands and your feet. We need to serve. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to go down through here. And this is really in, in the open Bible. It really has the idea of your submission to suffering. Your conduct in suffering you're going to suffer you're going to suffer no matter what you do you can suffer for christ and suffering for the disciple for the one who wants to really know god has tremendous glory to it there's a reason for it the highest glory is if you suffer with him you'll also reign with him right you're going to go through suffering you live in a cursed world this whole world is about suffering as the hindus say now, you can go through it for glory, or you can go through it for what? Shame. I mean, chastisement, all suffering looks like a form of shame, doesn't it? I mean, if you're sick, you don't want to tell anybody, because you know what? I don't want people to know I'm sick, you know? I mean, you look at Job in the pit, it's kind of shameful. This guy was like the greatest man. God showed him off, by the way, in suffering, didn't he? I mean, it was for Job's glory. God says, have you seen him? He's amazing. Now let's put it to the test. Let's get a contrast to how amazing he is. Can he deal with suffering and pain? And yet Job did. And Job, though not perfect, which none of us are, blessed God in the middle of his suffering, didn't he? Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You deserve the suffering. That's the big thing because we're all sinners. We're all in rebellion against God. You've all sinned and fallen way short. It's the mercy of God. He comes to you at all. It's his goodness that comes to you, not ours. Therefore, he is precious. Who not seeing, Peter says, we what? We love. I got to dig roots in that. I got to know that 26 times in, in the book of Ephesians, I am in him. In, in, in. Down, root, 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 in. The ground in love. I'm rooted and grounded in what? Love. Then I got to do what? I've got to learn of him. Come learn of me. There are all present and future imperatives. They're not asked of you. If you're a Christian, God doesn't care about your feeling because you're brought with a price. You're not your own. You're his. And so when he tells you to do something, he expects you to do it, doesn't he? The greatest grief of a pastor, and I'll get into this, is when you preach and you want to talk about heartbreak and nobody does anything. And that's not my heartbreak. That's greater to God. Imagine God speaks through his word and through the pulpit, which is where you come for a love feast, not a service. This isn't service. We need to change our words. This is really a love feast. You come to hear the love of God. You come to hear God's love for people and you listen and then you should submit under it. You should humble yourself under it, shouldn't you? To obey. But this is service. This isn't service. You should want to come here. Not, I have to go to church today. It's Sunday. Oh, man, it's a nice day. I have to go. You should say, I willingly, I want to go. I want to give the doxology. Peter has two doxologies from here to the end where he, he has theology. He's writing about, talk about, he's writing theology, by the way. <laughs> 
He's not reading it, he's writing it. And in the middle of his theology, he breaks out in a doxology of praise. Oh, glory be to God. It's amazing as he's facing suffering. Do you read the Bible like that? Oh, glory be to God. He breaks out in two. I hope we might break out in one. But he commands in suffering, here is the title. And he starts out, Peter, and this is really, if we did Revelation, you see that they're going into one of the historical accounts of the end times. This suffering period that they're about to go through, many people in the historical realm, when they, when they want to allegorize Revelation, say, this already happened. Peter says right here, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now, this is a type. And this was a great persecution of the early church, but the end is still not yet, has it? Is it? The end of all things is not at hand in this time period. The end of all things and the end times really begin at the leaving and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ till now. That's the whole period of time till right now is considered the end times. We're in the end times. The church has been bought by the blood from his side. We follow him because of his outrageous love. And then he says this, and I want you to really get this. Above all things, have fervent love. Isn't that good? How many want to live in fervent love? Man. There is no, listen, being in life, I'm still in love with my life fervently. My wife, my life, my wife. My life too with my wife. I love her fervently. I practice it every day. I want to be fervently in love. Why would I not want to be fervently in love? Every day. If you don't love your spouse like that, get right with God. You, by the way, you're commanded to love one another, especially your wife. There'd be no divorces if people loved each other fervently. True? The greatest sin in Revelation is they lost their fervency, their first love. True? That's a whole church that knew theology very well. And yet they lost their first love. Peter says, I need to know him fervently. Now, let me just say this about this section. It mixes, really, the fruit and the gifts. So many times you get people, let's talk about the gifts. Well, let me tell you something. If you don't have gifts and you don't, if without love, then you don't have the more excellent way in 1 Corinthians 13. In chapter 12, he goes through all the gifts of the body in detail, Paul. But then he says, let me show you a more excellent way. If you don't have love, you have what? Nothing. If you have gifts, I, you know, gifted people without an outrageous love for God and other people are really just talented people. And everything they do is about themselves because they love themselves. They become talents or gifts uh, when I really realize that they come from God and he empowers them. Because you're completely impotent, by the way. Without him, you can do what? Nothing eternal. Even if you manage to do something, make money, big, big deal. You end up in the, in the Ecclesiastes nightmares. I'm going to die and everything I have is going to waste. I'm going to give all that I have. Solomon gave everything he had to an idiot, his son. Who lost the kingdom in one day. So it's all vanity. But then Song of Solomon comes. And ends with the most fruitful woman. My breasts are like towers. I know that's a little provocative there. But what it speaks of is I have so much fruit. That it cannot even be counted. I am so fruitful. I'm so desired by my love. And you know what? That's the key. The key is a fervent love. Get that if you get anything out of, out of this thing. God loves you fervently. That's a good emotion, isn't it? And he wants you to be what? Like him. And therefore, we're commanded to love one another. And if you don't love one another, you're not his friend because he commands you with a command saying, love your brother. But if I don't love my brother, 
while I don't enter the verse you quoted in 15, uh, 14, you are my friends if I, you do what I say. We need to love fervently. Peter quotes it here as he mixed the gift, and they are always work together. They really do. Sometimes you want to separate them. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? What are the fruits of the Holy Spirit? I know all the verses, 522 of Galatians. I know all the gifts. I could have gone through them all over. But you know what? They only work if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Get grace, because that's a condition, by the way, conditional grace. Isn't that good? We're relearning. Isn't it good? This is a love feast. This isn't a church. I don't like that name either. You know why? Because no one knows what church means. Ah, it's the building up the street. I hate this. Is a building. This is not the church. The church are the called out ones. If you're saved, you're called out. And you responded to the call. And you got saved. And I pass from death unto life if I do what? In 1 John 3, I think it's 14. Love you. And if I don't love you, I don't. I live in what? Death. Because how can I, in 4.20 of 1 John, love God, who I don't see, and Peter says not seeing we love, if I don't love you? How can I love you? If I don't love you, how can I love God? I see you. God scratches his head. We need to love one another. We need to be hospitable. Here's a gift. There's a fruit. We need to be what? We need to be hospitable for people. Hey, this is in your bulletin. I prayed for this this morning, this week. This is a list of everyone that's hurting. If you're hurting, put your name on the list. Right? We should make mention for people, of people in our prayers like Paul did. You know what? You'll love your brother more if you pray for him. You'll see their face. You know, when you pray for people, I could, I could see their faces. Uh, yeah, Annette, yeah. I could see Carmela's face, yep. Yeah. Father, just touch Annette, yeah. Guess what? When I see Annette, I'll be more prone to love her because I've been seeing her all month. You getting this? I see her. Rich Benoit hasn't been out in a year, you know. I see him. Pray for him. We need to make mention. You need to have your heart expanded by God that you might stand in the evil day. And that's every day that's evil. We have a lot of them in this life. We need to be a hospital to one another without what? Grumbling. Grumbling. That's 1 John 5, 3. We just got out of 1 John. What's it say? His commandments are what? Not grievous to me. If they're grievous, something's wrong. I need to get right. That hurts my emotions. I need to get right. I need to get right every day. And so do you. As each one has received a gift to minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Man, he has got so many different graces for me. Logistical, spiritually, emotionally. He's got grace for anything. His favor's on me. Whatever I need. He's sufficient. He's my sufficiency in whatever I need. If anyone speaks, this is the best gift, Paul would say. Let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory. Here's the doxology in the middle of it. With glory and dominion and forever and ever. Amen. He had to break out. I need to minister. Hey, Easter's coming. These cards, I, I dug up a card in the back, which is the old come card. I also got a one for Easter. See that card there? The eye of God. I love this picture. And you know what the funny thing was? I put this in my pocket. I walked out. I looked at the, at the song sheet, and the picture of this was on the song. Isn't that funny how God does that? I haven't seen that picture on the thing in a long, long time. Years. And I found these cards in the back, and I said, we need to redo these cards. Come. Anybody know the last commandment in the Bible? Come. The spirit and the bride say come. Come. A future imperative that you'll be saying that even in heaven. Come. 
Jesus said it in Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Come unto me. Come learn of me. There's theology, but make sure it's of me. And make sure it's under me. Because I'm the head, you're the body, right? You've got to have humility with theology. And so, you know what? The last command is you'll be saying come for eternity. Whoever hear it, say come. And what are you going to do? Where are you coming? To drink freely of the waters of life. To eat of the tree. You better get used to saying come. We're going to go out for uh, Palm Sunday week and uh, to Easter when it starts getting a little bit warmer. And we're going to ask people to come. We haven't done that in a long time. Knock on all the doors around here. I'm sure tons of new people are in. But we want to say, come to people. It's a need to what? Minister. Beloved, do not, verse 12, do not think it strange concerning the fiery tribal, which is to try you. You know you need to be tried. I know we don't like that. We don't like being tried, but you need to be tried. Suffering is going to come anyway. Whether you like it or not, it's coming. As though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice. I mean, we lived in a cursed world, guys. The curses are all around you. True? I'm not going to suffer. Good luck with that. If you're not cursed, people around you are cursed, right? You're to walk in the blessing. And then curses do what? They begin to roll off your back a little more, right? And even if they don't, you're still being what? Suffering for glory, which is not to be compared. So the pay is tremendous. But we're to one thirteen. Rejoice. Rejoy myself. I need more joy to the extent that you partake in Christ's suffering. Remember what we said about Bonhoeffer last week. Bonhoeffer says you expect the throne without the shame. American Christianity expects everything to be blessing. Well, I don't have to partake in Paul's suffering or Jesus' suffering. Do you know you're called to suffer? The Apostle Paul was called to suffer, right? You're going to suffer many things. Thank God we're not the Apostle Paul. But you know what? We're going to suffer. Whether we like it or not. Isn't that awful against your emotions? So if I can't get away from it, I might as well what? Suffer for glory. Suffer for him. Listen. A lot of you could be sick, and I have no idea. I don't play voodoo who's sick and not sick. But you know what? Many of you, God will chastise in suffering. He does two things. If he chastises you, listen, when you get a spanking, it's kind of shameful. Anybody ever got spanked when they were a kid? The old ones really did. You younger ones, maybe not. But back then, they, they definitely spoiled the rod. Right? And spared the child. Today, that's horrible. It did me a world of good. I can tell you that. Every time I got spanked, I, I look back as a thankful memory that my father loved me enough to what? Discipline me. Because I deserve far worse. True? Most men love that stuff, by the way. But you know what? I can do what? I can see that, you know what? I need, if I get chastened and I know I'm off with God then I should be like, thank you, Jesus. I bear the shame, I repent, and now let me walk with you. Oh, God wouldn't chasten you, really? Everyone he loves, he chastens. No one spanks like God. I think that's why I have no backside, because it's gone. I don't know about you. But God chastens for your good, too, right? That you come out of yourself. Come out of yourself. You're not so amazing. Humble yourself. Do my will. You're made to do my will. You're made for what? Good works. Don't do it grudgingly, he goes on to say here. Don't do it that. It's glory. The Spirit of God, 14. Reproach you for the name of Christ. Blessed are you, the Spirit of glory, and God rests on you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. And this is when we backslide. A murderer, a thief. Well, I'm not that, an evildoer. How about a busybody? Dun, 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 dun. Well, you know. 
for you now. For you now. We need to watch our tongues. It's a fire, right? And the minute you do that, you become a judge. You put yourself not under people. You don't submit to people. But the Bible is going to go on here and say submit to one another. You put yourself as a judge over people. Why can't they be like me? God forbid. If you want to be like me, be like me if I follow Christ. Amen? Because I want to be like Christ. If you see Christ, follow it. If you don't, then run. Christ. Be very careful about your tongue. The judgment might come right back on you. God hates that stuff. Why don't you do this? When you want to judge somebody, do this. Make a habit. It's good to get godly habits. Pray. Pray that they won't be like you. Pray they'll be like Christ, right? True? We're not called to judge people. Or you will be judged, as the scriptures say. So we're not to suffer as a, what, gospel, slander, or busybody, the forms of murder in other people's matters. Let them stand before God like you. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. And therefore, in Romans, the greatest verse is what? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it's the power of God in 116 to those who what? Who believe to salvation. So I do it to the Jew, to everybody around me. I'm going to bring it to anybody, Paul says. But it's the power of God, and I'm not ashamed of it. Why? Because following Christ will bring you in this persecution and suffering, because all that live godly will suffer what? Persecution. My goodness, you learn that on the playground. Nothing more on a playground with kids than a goody-goody. Right? Goody-goody. Hey, let's go do this. No, I can't do that. That's wrong. You're a goody-goody. I'm going to torture you, right? Throw you in the mud. I remember dragging. I told the story again, one of my favorite stories of my cousins. We used to go get, we used to go to church and get in trouble. And you know what? We didn't want to go to church. We were kids. We wanted to play in the park in the mud and do all kinds of stuff like that and get in trouble and crazy, even at this age. That's how sinners we were. And we were all in our Easter suits and we went. This is an Easter message here in our Easter suits. And we were doing some kind of trouble. And we jumped in the mud in our Easter suits, me and my cousin. We didn't care. We hated these things. We hated suits. So we're in the mud, two little boys. And my other cousin goes, no, I'm not going to get in the mud. No, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm not going to do that. Well, we proceeded to get out of there and drag him through the mud. <laughs> drag him through the mud. Right, Izzy? There you go. And you know what? So we all went home in our suits, mud, up to our eyeballs. And they wanted to discipline them, but they, our aunt, my mother and my aunt just started laughing because we were a mess. But no, nobody likes a goody-goody. No one wants to be around somebody that lives for Christ that has convictions. You're going to automatically lose your friends. Have you suffered the loss of all things, like Paul said? I didn't just think about losing. I've suffered it. All things. Lost all my friends. Maybe my family hates me. For Christ, outrageous, fervent love that he gives to me and out of me. Paul did that. So if you want to be with Christ, his friend, you're going to suffer. They were suffered shame. You're going to have it. But the time has come, and this is where you really need to think you're Christianity. Because you just think you're a Christian. Really, are you? Do you really know you're a Christian? Are you going after God? Do you love him? Do you want to learn theology, but you want to learn it because you want to know him? Not because you want to be brilliant. Listen, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. 1 Corinthians 8.1. True? True? Not always remember, knowledge puffs up. Should we get knowledge? Yeah. Unless you want to live in your emotions all day long. Which leads you astray 90% of the time. I don't feel like it. Really? Kick yourself. As Oswald Chambers says, kick your mood out of you. Get an attitude that's right with God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You don't feel like it. Great. There's your feelings leading you astray from God. For the time has come, the judgment begin where? Oh, God, it's going to start out there. No, it's going to start in here. 
Read Hebrews chapter 6. This is about maturity. Fruit comes from maturity. Fruit comes when you're mature. I, you know, I've read all the church growth plans. And, you know, all the, well, we've got to get this. And you can go online and buy this church growth plan and this and that. Hogwash. There's only one church growth plan. That's the Bible. And the Bible wants me to love fervently. That's the book of Acts chapter 2. And when they loved one another fervently and they had all things in common, guess what? God added to them those that would be saved. Because their lives were so amazing and so loving and so obedient to God that God just fertilized that whole church. Within 35 years, that church collapsed, by the way. The devil's right there, isn't he? And that's what he says here when he goes on. If the righteous, verse 18, now, now, right now, guys, present tense. Yeah, that's what now means, now. Is this you? You guys really are really like locked in, you're saved, right? Oh, yeah, I'm saved. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Do you know if you don't mature, a fiery fire waits for you of God's wrath because you wasted, you could have matured, but you said, I don't need to because I know that God's love is unconditional and I don't need to do a damn thing. Maybe you damn yourself with that word. I don't need to go on an outreach. I don't need to learn the Bible. I don't need, I don't need, because God's love is unconditional. Trinitarian, Unitarian, believe in everything. Everyone's going to say that's not the Bible. The Bible is God wants fruit. And the husbandman waits in 2 Peter for the precious fruit of the earth. He waits for you, but doesn't wait forever. He wants you to grow. And he wants you to go. And he wants you to not fear. And he wants you to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit dwelling. And he wants the gifts to function as he gives it to you that this church might be built up. But this is a service. I come to service. I want Sunday to church. God, let me just start giving you a heaven's applauding right now that you came out on such a rainy day. And I thank you for coming. I really do. But do you realize all our lives God speaks into them and we do nothing? And that what God finally... Imagine having anything, job like that. Well, I worked all day and I, you know, I ministered. And what, did it, what happened? Nothing. Is there any fruit from your work? Did you get a paycheck? No. Nothing. They just looked at me. Okay. Do you think God has a right to be a little uh, mad at the church? you think it's our fault that the church is the way it is today? We live in the most unchurched area in the whole country, maybe the whole world, that has this professes Christianity. But in the country here, well, how do you see that? Blend into the woodwork or a tremendous opportunity in the middle of darkness? Do you know when the Great Awakening started? It was one of the darkest times in American Christianity. Light always shines brighter in the darkness, right? Do you know God needs you? Yeah, he made it that way in a relationship with you. Therefore, 19, those that suffer according to the will of God. This is why you want to say, you're going to suffer. Do you suffer according to the will of God? Maybe God would keep you healthy if you suffered according to the will of God. We're going to do communion. Why are people hurting? Many of you do not discern the body of Christ, what the body's supposed to do. You don't discern your function in the kingdom of God. Therefore, many of you sleep. Translation in the Greek, dead. Many of you are dead. Many of your people are dead and sick. That's called chastisement, by the way. Because you don't discern your role that God died for you to have for glory. He calls you to glory. Do you believe that today? The elders who are among you, I exhort, who am also a fellow elder. He was given the commission in John 21 to feed the flock. So it just goes back to that. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. 
He tells me, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, not forced, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. The pulpit has been destroyed in this country by people that have done it for what? Gain in some way, shape, or form. This goes both ways from the people in the pulpit to the people in the seats which are used. Nor as being lords over, the, over those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. I'm hoping, looking forward to that. Whether I get that or not, that's God's to give. But I want to be someone that feeds and I want to be somebody that serves. And I want to speak the truth to you in love that we're called to glory. A doxology. Saints need to do what? Submit. Likewise, you younger people. He picks on younger people because they're the most unbroken in life. Older people are a little bit softer because they've been through life. Young people, people don't want to yield to anything. They have their own free will. That's why we have churches with young people and we have churches with old people. Isn't that great? You're all people. Young, old, in between. God wants churches to be together in all generations, by the way. That's what God rejoices in. But we don't live in that age. Younger people, don't submit yourself to the elders. Do you know you have to submit to me? God said so. And then boo boo. I'm not submitting to anybody. Do exactly what you want to do. Do whatever you want. If I'm serving, if I'm living the life, you know what? I'm far from perfect. But let me tell you something. I love God. I love my wife. I love you guys. And I don't water down the truth to you. I preach you a fairy tale of happy, happy, happy. No, glory, suffering, joy, unspeakable, full of glory, hope, which we're saved by, by the way. Then you need to submit. That's a bad word today. You don't submit to nobody. Good luck with that. Maybe that's the way why the, you're the way you are. We live in an age of pride. I can do whatever I want when I want to do. You can also do whatever you want. God bless you. But he won't. You walk right back into the curse. God resists the proud. James, he lays battle ray against you. So much for the unconditional loving God. He sets a battle ray. Is what the, it's a military to resist. He sets battle ray against you but i'm saved really if you walk in the curse you don't know you're saved do you you may be you may be not if and or but flip a coin maybe you never got saved i don't know i know how do i know i'm saved i love him i'm looking at him every day i bow the knee every day i pick up my cross you know one of the things we need to kneel more you know we don't kneel anymore I can't get down. Let me help you. Hold on. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get down there. Maybe I need a, a high low to pick me up. And some of you can't bow, I know. But you know what? You need to bow the knee. Do you know how you pick up your cross? I did this this morning because I, I had the thought the other day. I go, I need to bow the knee. You know why? Because you can't pick up a cross unless you bow the knee. Can you? Maybe you could, Fred, but we can't. It's shoulder underneath it, right? I got my cross. It's your cross, by the way. There's worse suffering. It could have been you on the cross. Do you know the Romans killed thousands as a backdrop to the cross? Thousands, which we'll be preaching on. Line the roads. Line the walls. For disobedience to Rome. What do you think disobedience to the King of King and, and the glory and the Lord of Lords and the kingdom of God should be? No big deal. A Roman Empire, which was brutal, 
but a kingdom of God that is perfect and died for you that you wouldn't be what? Lost for eternity. I think we owe God all the glory. He is the sheep shepherd. We resist it. And he gives grace to the humble. You understand what you get when you submit? You get grace to the humble. If you can't, okay, if you can't submit to the word of God preached and the people, oh, it's just Pastor Chad. He's always like that. Really? That's the Bible. I'm saying the Bible, which the Holy Spirit wrote. Okay? Oh, that's just his opinion. I'm glad you have an opinion. That's the Bible. That's God's opinion, by the way. He has one, too. And his is what? Omnipotent, and you're impotent, by the way. You can't even keep yourself alive a day more. You might be dead tomorrow. One day you will be, right? Are you ready? Better bow to me, because whether you like to or not, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he's Lord. Better practice now. Better submit to people that God puts over you and trust that, and if they do you wrong, then that's their problem. But you still submit it. We live in an age nobody submits. Nobody honors a pastor. How did it get that way? Right here in every church around us. American Christianity infiltrated by hell. There's so many that fall. Hey, I don't want to build up the pastor too far. He might fall. Boy, I need all the encouragement I can get. I could do this by force. Nobody wants to be a pastor anymore because nobody honors a pastor anymore. Nobody honors a cop anymore. No one honors the president anymore because no one honors God anymore. And therefore, if it doesn't turn back in the church, it will never turn back in the world, will it? I've learned to take cursing or blessing either way. It's a small thing, like Paul said, that you judge me. It's God that judges me. And so he judges you too, right? Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting your cares upon you for he cares for you. I'm going to close with this. An, alti an attitude for altitude. or ad An altitude for attitude. Four, five attitudes he gives. I'm going to give him real quick to you. Number one, he wants you to submit. He wants you to have an attitude of what? Submission. Because you have a, your, your affection seated above. You have an altitude. This is where Colossians 3 talks about. Set your heart on things above. Where Christ, your life is hid with Christ, right? Let me get the verse right. Set your affections on things above where your life is hid in Christ in God, okay? i got to have an altitude to submit. I'm not submitting to anybody unless God tells me and I've got an attitude because I have an altitude. My head's in heaven. The Bible says I'm seated there in Ephesians 2, 6. I can submit to anybody. It doesn't take away from who I am because I'm seated in heaven. I'm a son of God. I can submit... Jesus was Lord of all. And he submitted to us. What did he do to the disciples? Wash their feet. You can't submit to somebody. He washed their feet. You call me Lord, Lord, he said. And so I am. But I am amongst you as one at what? Serves. Is submitted to the cause that I came for, you. And he earned to be the highest power. He earned your love. And still, do we have fervent love for him, even though we earned it, even though he paid for it? Look around you, look behind you. Is anybody standing in line to die for you? I say this all the time to people. Hey, I look behind me, I look for someone who was going to die for me, but there's nobody there. Except Christ. He's a different kind of God. Number two, you have to have an altitude for an attitude of humility. You have to humble yourself before God. Listen, he didn't call you. None of you are mighty. 
None of you are noble. I get so tired of like, I'm going to be noble. I'm going to get a degree. Really? Are you going to be humble with that degree? He didn't call the wise, not many. I'm not saying no one was wise. Paul was one out of the 12. He was the 13th, wasn't he? Not many wise, not many noble, impotent people. That he might take impotent people and confound the wise with tremendous courage. Isn't that what they looked at the the apostles? Who are these people? They've been with Jesus. Number two, number three, an altitude for an attitude of trust and hope. He says that when he says, cast your cares upon him in verse seven. In other words, I have an attitude because I'm in an altitude that no matter what suffering I'm going through, no matter what anxiety, I can give it to him. He gets all the headaches. He's the head. I don't have to sit there and worry. Some of you drive yourself crazy with worry. Cast it on him and pray and believe and hope. That pleases God, by the way. Be anxious for nothing, you would say, at the end of the greatest sermon ever, the Beatitudes. I need to have an attitude like that because I have an altitude with God. I need to have that. I need to have an attitude to be sober here. I need to have self-control in my life. The Holy Spirit gives that. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? That's a fruit. The fruit it is. I need to have that. I need to have self-control. I may have been a wreck in chaos, but now I have what? Self-control. And then I need to have an attitude to have an altitude to be vigilant. I need to have an attitude to be vigilant and always watching. In other words, I'm always about the Lord's business. I need to be vigilant. I need to be sober, in verse 8, vigilant, because my adversary, the devil, walks around as a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that in the same sufferings are experienced in your brothers in the world, and they are. You'd like to be in China right now, where they're gathering up Christians? What's for lunch? Yeah, sad. It's pitiful. But we need to go forward and we need to be vigilant and know our brothers are. But may the grace of God, verse 10, who called you into his eternal glory by Jesus Christ after you have suffered a while, perfect you, establish and strengthen you and settle you, then a doxology to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Worship. Do you know if you're humble, you worship? If you're not humble, you don't worship. Do you know that? Do you worship? I had a great morning with worship, music, worship. Loved it as I was reading and studying. Worship. The humble do what? Worship. They listen to Christian music because they can worship. I'm not saying you can never listen to secular music, but most of it you can't. But I need to be someone who what? worships why because that makes me beautiful and you know what happens when i'm beautiful this is why this is this is my church growth plan that you would be beautiful isn't that good and there's my phone telling me we have communion is that an usher god wants me to be beautiful why what happens with the beauty of it what happens when the flower is beautiful and the sap flows what happens the birds the bees come don't they and what do they do They pollinate the flower so it might bring the seed or the fruit, don't they? See, when you're beautiful, when a church is beautiful like this, in submission, what happens? Then the Holy Spirit comes. Who wins people to Christ? You? All you do is say, come. 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 I got a small part. Hey, come to Jesus. Who saves? Who seals? When you're beautiful, the Holy Spirit will what? Pollinate the fruit around you. And what will happen? People will get saved. The people would want to be near you. Why? Because people like the beautiful people. And God has a plan to make you beautiful. But that's his plan. And guess what? He's going to use suffering to do it. Because that is the scrub, scrub here, scrub, scrub there of God. For the tin man. And then you'll see much fruit, right? And he'll prune you. To get more fruit. But hallelujah, the glory. Ushers come forth with communion. I know we're late.